Welcome, welcome into the dream sphere. I'm your storyteller, Emily Goodwin, and I'm a little more than fascinated with dreams, you could say. I'm not shy about walking up to someone and out of the blue asking them if they're sleeping well and if they have any dream stories to share with me. I've gotten to this point in my life where I've started dedicating a good amount of time to dream recall in order to see how it helps me with my mental health and slowly building up a personal document about symbols, emotions, and sensations related to dreams. I will for sure go into this more later, I think, but for now I'm starting this podcast as a personal project to gain more knowledge about dreams, nightmares, lucidity, sleep paralysis, shared dreams, and all that good stuff. I thought I'd share the stories I find with you in case this topic is also something that piques your interest. I want to explore, have fun, push the boundaries of my limited understanding of this world that we live in, and hopefully get some conversations rolling. This first episode, I'll be nattering on about Christopher Robinson. And before you ask, no, I'm not talking about Winnie the Pooh's human friend. No, no, I'm talking about the man known as the Dream Detective. I must admit, I love all things wild, weird, and out of this world, so when I came across Chris, I was pretty excited to learn more about what it means to be a dream detective. Christopher Robinson was born in 1951, Dunstaple, England, with a heart defect. At the time, it was inoperable due to the lack of advancements in medicine. However, when he was nine years old in 1960, he was selected to have an open heart surgery to, his, to fix his blocked aorta, which of course was a success. Or I wouldn't be telling you this story right now. As I'm recording these notes, I'm listening to this interview with Chris, and he states that he never had any fear of the potential of dying, even at such a young age. The doctors didn't think he would make it to the age of 12, and when the surgery was successful, he remembers feeling a great sense of thankfulness and a need and want to help other people the best that he could because he felt like he was given a second chance. When he was 20, he witnessed a woman getting hit by a truck. There was a hospital right across the road, which he ran to ask for help. He says that they told him that he needed to call an ambulance that they couldn't go out and help this woman. He was so upset and angry and confused by the pure stupidity and illogical way of this system and watched this woman die in his arms because the emergency vehicle took too long to arrive. He couldn't save her. Already in his life, he's had many intense experiences that I can hardly imagine myself. He went to college and studied to be an electrical technician fixing TVs and other electronics. He studied, studied photography and investigative journalism, which he then began doing for the local newspaper. When a story arose, he would go out, document as much as he could, taking pictures, writing notes, and all that good stuff. Through this position, Chris came to know many of the police officers and the lead investigator on many cases at Scotland Yard. At the age of 35, Chris had an NDE which, if you don't know what that is, it's a near-death experience, during a heart attack. I watched a YouTube video where Chris is being interviewed about this experience, and the way he describes it is actually kind of funny. I'll put the link in the description if you'd like to go and see it yourself, and I'll do my best to capture its bluntly down-to-earth recollection of a seemingly, seemingly ethereal experience. He says that as he had his heart attack, he left his body into a brightly lit space, panicking, trying to breathe, and a voice said to him, you don't have to breathe anymore. And he said, oh, yes, I do. He was being told by this being that he was going to go with them at that time and that breathing wasn't necessary wherever it was. But Chris really didn't want to go, and he got into this kind of argument with this ethereal being or beings explaining that he needed to help the people back home because they were working with the police on an important project to do with anti-corruption in the UK. The bad guys are going to win, he explained to them. He was so adamant about coming back, so the beings agreed that, yeah, he could go back. However, they told him that he would have to live in both his and their world from now on. 
He says that he had no idea what they were talking about at the time and just agreed. Yeah, sure, whatever. I just want to go back. Chris came back to his body, terrible chest pains and all that from the heart attack, and got checked out in the hospital. And everything went along fine and dandy until he started experiencing, and I quote, these wacko dreams about things that would happen the next day or within just a few days. As they progressed in the following months, they became more violent and disturbing. He dreamt about bombs, people being gunned down, airplanes crashing, and other horrible traumatic events. He decided to start writing down his dreams and that he would have to start opening up to the police about it if they got more serious. Since he had a good connection with the police already, it wasn't as difficult as he had expected. But obviously, if you're talking about foretelling the future, specifically about extremely dangerous subjects, they are going to take notice and even suspect Chris had something to do with it. The morning of December 21st, 1988, Chris was walking along Fleet Street talking to two policemen that he knew about a dream he had had the night before. He told them that in his dream, he witnessed two terrorists place a bomb inside some luggage at an airport he identified as the Heathrow Airport, which is the main airport in London, England. He saw the plane flying through the air. It exploded and everyone died. That evening at 7 p.m., the Pan Am Flight 103 took off from Heathrow Airport towards New York City. Less than 40 minutes later, it exploded over Lockerbie, Scotland, killing everyone on board and 11 Scots on the ground. Absolutely devastating. As you can imagine, Scotland Yard summoned him the following day for questioning. At first, even Chris, along with the investigators and police force, chalked his dreams to coincidence. But they kept coming, and coming, and coming. He has recorded thousands of dreams up to date, predicting events that mostly have to do with terrorist attacks, tragedies, and other profound accidents as well. He's worked with the Police Special Branch, Secret Service, Ministry of Defense in the UK, and CIA, CIA, NSA, and Pentagon in the USA. He's taken part in many psychological studies led by professors, doctors, and scientific researchers, researchers all across the world. There's loads of directions you could potentially hone in on with Chris Robinson, and my brain is a bit chaotic. I think I got a little off topic, or maybe I didn't. Honestly, I don't really know. I have a difficult time figuring out if I'm making any sense, so I'll just plow right ahead and uh, read you a few dreams he had along with some of the symbology that came up that he began to recognize. He explains that if he was associated with a place, if he knew more about it or had visited that location before, his dreams about that place were more clear, more defined. The subjects were easily identifiable, which to me makes a lot of sense. Say if you're talking to someone and they describe something to you, it's a lot easier for you to picture it in your mind's eye if you've seen pictures of that thing before, or if you have come into contact with that place or object. Now, this is where I got a little lost, and I'll do my best to explain it. He describes they began to notice that there was this kind of feedback loop. When an attack would happen, the police would call Chris, and Chris would drive to the location as quickly as possible. They found that when he did this, he began to have dreams where he would spring up random in... Sorry spring up in random locations that he hadn't been to in years or had never been to at all, weeks before an event would actually happen. So they were able to make a connection of a bomb site with his going there, and this would create a loop where he would know about it a few weeks prior. Okay. Whew. I get it, but I don't get it. It's a pretty deep concept to try and wrap your head around. Uh, Non-linear time, past, present, future all being one, those things are pretty out of my scope of understanding. And if someone else knows about it, I'd love to hear your explanation because I tried Googling it and I just got so confused. So hopefully that didn't confuse you too much. I kind of know what he's saying, but anyway, moving on. When he dreams, sometimes he is an observer, watching as the events occur from above. Sometimes he's actually one of the victims and can feel that he is dead and understands that he is dead. This I can kind of relate to, and maybe you can as well, um, on being an observer and a victim. 
from many other perspectives as well, which is such a cool aspect of the dreamscape, being able to see and experience multiple viewpoints than just your own. The symbols he's been able to identify in his dreams are pretty interesting. He knows that for him, dogs represent terrorists. Fish are terrorists that are about to be caught. Cups are dead bodies. I have no idea why that would be, but I guess it makes sense to him. Meat pies are body parts, which that makes sense to me. Heavy rain indicates a dangerous situation is coming, and snow is an extremely dangerous event that will be much bigger and more catastrophic. He relates his symbols to things like crossword clues. Dreams have all these cryptic and associative interactions that are specific to the person who is having the dream, but also to the cultural structure of the society that we live in. For Chris, this cultural structure is Britain, so things that are related to Britain specifically, he would understand and know because he is related to that symbol. For example, if I was to dream about the CN Tower in Toronto, that is going to be a very significant symbol to me because Toronto is my city, and the CN Tower represents our architectural accomplishments and is a large landmark to let you know that you are indeed in Toronto, Ontario, Canada whereas Chris might dream of Big Ben in London or the London Eye. I hope this kind of makes sense. Can you think of any dream images that represent something significant to you? If you can, please email me, message me, get a hold of me somehow, I don't know how, but I want to know what, what symbols mean to you. I'll read you a couple more interesting stories from Chris that I have found, uh, just because there's so many of them, but... I'll put some descriptions in the end notes of this podcast so that you can go and look it up too if you want to find out more about him. In 2002, two little girls, Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman, went missing in Soham, Cambridgeshire. Chris had a dream the night before they died about children playing in the snow. And as we know now, that snow for Chris indicates grave danger. The girls later returned to him in his dreams a few days later telling him that they feared their bodies would be eaten by wild animals. This confirmed for him that they were now sadly dead. In a preceding dream, he found himself walking down a runway at the Air Force Base at Mildenhall, about 10 miles from Soham, Cambridge, where the girls lived. He was looking at the, the parameter of the fence and wrote down on a map and pinpointed the areas that their bodies were. Chris tried to warn the Cambridge police and that the girls were dead and that he knew the locations of their bodies however they ignored him and continued for another 10 days to search believing the girls were still alive their bodies were eventually found at the spot that chris had marked on his map almost two weeks before in his book dream detective published in 1997 he goes into much more detail about his experiences and the different dreams that he has had I haven't read it, and I'll have to put it on my wish list for now, but if you're interested in learning more from his own experience and his own publications, it's on Amazon, I think, for about 20 bucks or so-ish. He's been in loads of documentaries. He's been on Strange But True, which is a British TV series, and about the unusual and unexplained, which you can actually find on YouTube. He's been in many experiments. The most well-known one was done by Dr. Gary Schwartz, an American psychologist and professor at the University of Arizona. Chris asked Dr. Schwartz, sorry, Dr. Schwartz, Schwartz, (laughs) I'm so sorry, Dr. Schwartz to develop an experiment with him that would show the implications of his dream premonitions. Here's a quick summary of how this assessment went in August 2001 at the University of Arizona. Dr. Schwartz wrote on 20 different slips of paper, 20 different locations that Chris and himself were to visit over the next 10 days. Then he put them into separate envelopes and sent the envelopes to one of his colleagues in New York City. His colleague in New York would then select 10 of the 20 envelopes at random, and the morning of each location, they would get, uh, he would message them and find out what the location was going to be the morning of. 
Dr. Schwartz would then drive Chris to the location and go over Chris's dream logs from the night before. In each circumstance, there were many identifiable factors that led Dr. Schwartz to believe his prognitive dreams were the real deal. One example was on the fourth day he recorded a dream where he was in a cafe in Greek Street, Soho. He had two rolled up newspapers, the sun and the mirror, which he used as a telescope to look up at the sky. He also had a camera. He noted that it was an Olympus make. He decoded this dream to mean that the two men would be visiting a mountain where they would be some kind of telescope or mirror used to look at the sun. On that day, Dr. Schwartz discovered that they, would be, that they would be visiting Kitt Peak, which is a solar observation helioscope observatory in Soho on top of the Arizona mountain. Pretty wild. Now, of course, there's been a lot of speculation and skepticism with this, but what the heck, literally anything supernatural is approached with skepticism, so... I'm not even going to bother going into that side of it because I'm here to research crazy stories about dream experiences, not to prove that superpowers are impossible, okay? There's still so much that I could talk about related to Christopher Robinson, but I think I'll end it off with a bit of a bang in honor of Extraterrestrial Abduction Day, which is on March the 20th, this coming Saturday. I'll read to you Chris's experience with aliens in his dreams that I found on a fantastic podcast called Understanding Spirit by Alan Cox. In 2002, Chris was 51 years old at this point. He was put on a waiting list to have surgery after the barium, 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 barium? Barium? Barium swallow, which is when a patient drinks this special liquid that helps highlight interior issues within the body when taking an x-ray. It had found a hiatal hernia, which is when a small part of your stomach and the bottom of your esophagus, the big tube from your mouth to your stomach, pushes up into your chest through your diaphragm muscles. Oof, that sounds painful. Three weeks before he was scheduled to go in for his surgery, he dreamt that he was on a spaceship. He's very adamant here that he was in bed, dreaming about being on a spaceship, not that he was actually on a spaceship. Chris describes it as extremely vivid. He felt so lucid, he believed he really was on a spaceship, even though he knew he was in bed. In the dream, he had been operated on by these aliens, and the next morning, he looked at his right arm where there were three puncture marks, like an equilateral equilateral triangle, and the biggest bruise he had ever seen. And he thought, gee, what is that? So he went to his doctor, and his doctor asked him what the heck he'd been doing in the night. Chris explained that it definitely had not been there the night before. His doctor said that he had never seen anything like it before in his life, but it wasn't septic, meaning it wasn't infected or life-threatening, and to make sure to clean it and the bruises will eventually go away on their own. They were puzzled, but thought nothing more of it. About three weeks later, Chris went in for his scheduled appointment for the hiatal hernia repair. They did another borium barium, borum, swallow, and were going to draw on his stomach where they were going to make the incision. When the doctor asked him, when did you have the operation? Chris said to him, what do you mean I have it? When am I going to have it? You're going to do it right now. The doctor says, no, it's already been done. And Chris said, don't be silly. The doctor asked him if he is Christopher Robinson, listing off his date of birth, hospital appointment information, etc., etc., Chris says, yeah, that's me. And the doctor then goes on to say that he can't explain it, but the operation has already been done. There isn't anything else that the doctor can do for him, and you better get dressed and go home. It's funny the way Chris talks about this experience on the podcast. He asks the host, so what the heck happened to me then? I didn't get beamed up. I was sleeping. I was asleep in bed. I was booked in for the operation, got funny marks on my arms, and then I didn't need the operation. How the heck do you explain that? 
That's a good question, Chris. I have no idea. Aliens. I love how flabbergasted he sounds. Actually, pretty much all the interviews I watched with him and the documentaries and such, he always seems so amazed by his own experiences. I can't even believe them. He can't, he can't even believe them himself, which I find really fascinating. I know if I had experiences like him, I would probably be in the same boat. I probably wouldn't even believe myself. Anyway, this has been a pretty long-winded first stab at this podcast stuff for me, so I think I'm going to wrap it up here. But so far, I'm loving it. I'm loving the stories I'm finding. I'm loving the wackiness of it all. It's a lot of fun, and I hope I find more extraordinary people to do a little bit more research on within the dream, uh, dream realm and places and things to talk about in future episodes. I'd really love to talk about this stuff, any experiences that you may have had of dreams or dream symbology and all that good stuff. I actually have an email set up. It's called into the dream sphere at gmail.com. I'm on Instagram and TikTok at the same name. I don't really know how to use Twitter, so I probably won't be on there, but please message me. I want to hear from you. I want to hear your stories. I want to share stories. I want to have fun exploring this weird, weird world that we live in and all its unknown crevasses. Um, it's very exciting to me, and I could probably gush about it all day. So if you have any suggestions for future episodes or would like, to, would like me to share your experiences on the podcast, maybe I could do that eventually. That would be so cool. I'd love to get a collection of people's dream experiences. Start making like a, a book or something. A catalog, if you will. That would be very cool. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really can't wait to hear from you and continue doing these cool, fun, experimental research areas of the weird dreamscape and dream world and all that kind of stuff. So for now, let your dreamscape expand, reach out, and be open to those mind-boggling ideas that are just on the outskirts, just out of our reach of understanding. Please message me. Have a wonderful day. Love you loads. Bye.